and kick it off. Sure. Um, thanks, Amy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alina Bachu. I direct the Roundtable on Population Health Improvement um, at the National Academies. And like Amy, I've been supporting the case challenge since 2014 and really excited to see all of you and really looking forward to this year's event. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. And I'll also explain that the reason we do this is primarily because uh, not all the students who participate in the case challenge um, are getting a degree in public health or have uh, any background in public health. Um, and just to get sort of a, a sense of where everyone is coming from, can I just see a, a show of hands? Uh, just use the the uh, raise hand function. How many people know what I'm talking about when I talk about upstream and downstream in the public health context? All right, so it sounds like uh, some of you know what we're talking about, but not necessarily everyone. So um, it won't be a total waste of time, but I will go through this um, somewhat somewhat quickly. Um, and if anyone who's familiar with the concepts um, and the evidence that I'm talking about has anything that they like to add, uh, you know, please feel free to, uh, to pitch in at, at the end of my presentation. So I'll go through this fairly quickly. Um, Um, very, very uh, well-known slide that I think most of you have seen um, that shows that in the United States, the way in which we invest in healthcare uh, and invest in health, I should say, uh, primarily in healthcare really doesn't line up at all with what we achieve for it. Um, and as we have heard in the news over the last several years, life expectancy in the United States has been on the decline. We know the mortality rate among American children um, is increasing at a rapid pace. Um, and yet we continue to outspend the world um, on healthcare. And as the next slide shows, our spending on healthcare is growing uh, leaps and bounds and passing other countries. Um, I think I will have to uh, update the slide at some point. I think we're now uh, around 19%. Um, and you could look at the OECD uh, for additional uh, data on various things that compare the US to the average among our peer nations, um, wealthy developed countries. Um, and you could see here, the average is the red bar, the United States is at the far left. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen the graph that shows how our spending is higher than everyone's and our healthcare is sort of mediocre um, if you put those two uh, dimensions together. Um, the disconnect between our national spending versus our achievement in health um, is, is obvious and it has to do in part with um, not investing in the right kinds of things. And also it has to do with uh, inequities that are uh, seen along the lines of um, race and ethnicity and tribal status, and you can also see them um, lined up with disability status, uh, sexuality, citizenship status, etc. Um, so in this country, uh, we see that people who fall in certain categories uh, will perform better on health than people who fall in other categories. Um, and the reason all of this is happening is, uh, as I've already said a little bit, um, Healthcare in the United States is both too much and too little. Uh, it's the wrong care. It's care that is biased and uh, there's also discrimination in it. Um, I'll put in a quick plug here uh, to keep an eye open over the next few months because the National Academies is revisiting the unequal treatment report. And Amy, I'm wondering if you could put the link to the old report in the chat. Um, the unequal treatment report came out in 2003 and showed how in the healthcare domain specifically, um, people of color experience uh, poor health health outcomes, health care outcomes because of the differential treatment that they receive. Um, I'm sure many of you who are uh, getting trained to uh, be professionals in, in, in the realm of healthcare are gonna be very familiar with this. Um, and we also know that healthcare is one of the many factors that shape health. We know that there's also housing, education, and other um, factors that operate along the life course and that we can intervene on um, earlier in life and at various points. Um, and beneath all of that are some of the root causes, racism and discrimination and poverty. 
um, these three issues were um, also very clearly outlined with a great deal of discussion of the evidence base in the um, National Academy's report, Communities in Action, Pathways to Health Equity. Um, and this is a report that Amy was the study director for, um, and it provided really extensive uh, discussion of how um, disadvantages accumulate um, in certain members of our communities and um, how there, there are uh, sort of stacked um, issues that, that contribute to poor, poor health outcomes for, for some people. Um, Amy, I don't know if you want to share that link too. Sorry. Um, it's just a really, really terrific report. The other thing about it that I'll mention is that um, it's got an entire chapter that provides um, sort of deep dive discussions of nine community-based uh, cross-sector partnerships. Um, so if you ever need uh, good examples of that sort of thing, you could refer to that report. All right, um, very quickly, we've seen a, a strong trend towards medicalization of health in the United States, uh, hence the focus on health care rather than health more broadly. Um, um, and just very briefly here, there's also a, a, a very narrow policy focus on health um, care interventions. Um, but we have seen some positive signs in the last several years with greater attention to health-related social needs, uh, sometimes called non-medical um, uh, needs. Uh, things like housing and transportation and asking a patient, do you have food at home to take this medication with? Do you, were you able to get a ride to your doctor's appointment? Um, and those kinds of things. Um, and we know there's a, there's a screening tool that CMS has developed. Um, and in many healthcare settings, there's not only screening, but there's also uh, an effort to connect people to the social services that they need, um, which is all very, very good. Um, but beyond that, um, we are aware of the term social determinants of health. I think if I ask for a show of hands, most of you also raise your hands for that. We know that the circumstances in which people bo born and, and in which people are born, they grow up and they live um, and uh, they work age, et cetera, um, are going to have an effect on um, their health and on their well being. And just a quick note at the bottom here that health related social needs are not equal to the social determinants of health because referring people to a food bank uh, is not the same as changing policies to prevent food insecurity in the first place, or um, you know, preventing child poverty or cutting child poverty in half as we were able to do in 2021 as a result of uh, the pandemic era spending and policies that um, uh, provided a, a child tax credit that made just a really dramatic difference. Um, very quickly, some of you may have seen this image. It's actually based uh, on um, a publication by David King, Kindig and Greg Stoddard from 2003 that defines population health. Um, Maggie, I had that in the chat earlier, if you wouldn't mind sharing that link. Um, I forgot to put it in here um, in, in the slide itself for when we share it with you guys. But um, the, the bottom line is that policies and interventions at the individual and social levels are available uh, to help change those patterns of health determinants over the life course and help improve outcomes. Um, there are sort of color-coded examples here. Um, I'll just point out the one in the lower right-hand side um, that shows you sort of the difference between the downstream and the upstream, which I talked about earlier. Um, when we talk about down downstream, we're talking about at the individual level, sort of proximate to the individual patient or the individual community resident. When we're talking about upstream, we're talking about um, higher level population level interventions that can help um, interrupt the trajectories that bring us to those poor individual level outcomes. Um, so any, one, one example in that first bullet of, is screening for cardiovascular disease or for cancer is an example of a downstream uh, prevention strategy uh, at the patient level. Although of course you could have uh, you know, policies to cover that kind of screening at a, at a population level. Um, but quality universal pre-K is something that can help improve people's health because we know um, that a higher level uh, of education, higher quality education, et cetera, is associated with, with better health outcomes too. Um, but we'll share this with you later, so I won't go into uh, further detail. Um, and a couple of, and I'm realizing, I think I have, shoot, I am sharing a slightly uh, older slide set, doesn't, ha doesn't have an image that I wanted to share with you all, but that's okay. Um, we have the a, a few different graphics of the social determinants of health and the socio-ecological model of health. 
Um, and I'll go through these very quickly. In that green circle, you see things like education, work environment, water and sanitation, healthcare services, again, putting healthcare in the context of the broader array of factors um, that we know shape people's health. Um, I think many of you may have seen this as well. Um, it speaks to um, the very, uh, the very various levels where interventions um, are, are possible uh, to help improve people's health. And I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, sorry, my, my revised uh, slide set that we're gonna share with you is gonna be a little bit briefer than this one, uh, which is why I'm skipping. Um, I'm gonna talk about this just a little bit because it's relevant to the case, no matter what the topic is, and you'll very quickly realize how relevant it is to the, the case that we're releasing in, in just a little while. Um, there are you know, many factors um, that shape health, and there are multiple levels at which these factors operate. Um, at the community level, there are relationships among institutions, social networks, there are cultural norms and standards that um, influence individuals, groups, and organizations. We have, of course, seen the role of um, social media and other um, factors that help to sort of uh, speed up the uptake of certain, certain norms, for example. Um, in terms of public policy, um, we have local, state, and federal policies that create or contribute to health disparities, but they can also support um, socioeconomic well being um, and so forth. Um, primary prevention, secondary prevention. I think everybody is familiar with uh, the differences there. Um, and just a little bit on policy. Um, and the reason we talk about policy a lot in public health, as many of you will know, is because it allows us to um, take actions that have uh, the greatest or have the potential for the greatest level of impact at the population level. Um, and policy is a cause uh, of structural determinants of health, uh, like in, in inequities, um, issues such as regressive tra taxation, residential segregation, and lax regulation, um, things like um, air and water that are not clean, um, taxes that are advantageous to uh, people who buy houses as opposed to people who rent houses, I should say people who own houses as opposed to renters, um, and of course uh, policies such as redlining that many of you will know about um, that have contributed to residential segregation over generations. Um, the, the most powerful way to intervene and thwart the negative pathways that I mentioned earlier is at the population level. Um, and quickly on policy with a big P, policy with a little P. And this is some, something that will come up in the course of developing your solutions uh, to, to the case. Um, policies with a big P pertains to policies uh, by government. Um, these are laws, regulations, court rulings, administrative rules, et cetera. The, there are consequences for not following or for violating such policies. These could include taxes uh, for certain things, um, they could include uh, fines. Um, and then we also have policies with a little p. Um, these are more informal and sort of at a, at a lower level, generally not governmental. Um, they may be organizational, you know, company policies. They may be uh, policies at a, at a community level, at a school level or a school district level. Um, they could be policies that are imposed by an association. Um, one example here would be the American Medical Association announcing in November of last year at their annual meeting that um, they were going to adopt a policy that, or a policy statement that um, voting and civic participation are a social determinant of health. Um, that was sort of an exciting development. Um, but again, that kind of uh, declaration from a professional association does not have um, the power that the Voting uh, Rights Act has or, uh, you know, the potential of uh, undoing the harm that um, the Supreme Court's dismantling of the Voting Rights Act under the Shelby decision has. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the power of the big P, the sort of uh, softer influence of the little P. But that's not to say that little P does not have uh, the, the, the ability to play a role or to shape um, the environment or the conditions for health and well-being. Um, 
And I think I'm just going to skip these last two uh, because they're not in my new deck. So I will stop there and see if there are any questions um, about what I've shared so far. So if you have a question, you can just raise your hand and um, you can say your question, or if you're not comfortable doing that, that's okay. You can put it in the chat and we'd be happy to read it. Um, and um, we're gonna go over some other things. So if you have a question later on in the session, you can certainly ask it then as well. And just a, a quick recap um, of why we we provide this this brief slide set and talk about all of these issues. Um, it, it, it's really to help encourage the teams to look upstream, to look at the factors outside of the healthcare setting that can be uh, helpful and we evidence indicates are helpful in helping to uh, address poor health outcomes or whatever the, the health challenge that is being described in the case is. Um, focusing on just um, healthcare um, interventions is really not sufficient given what we know about um, the factors that shape people's health outcomes um, and, and what we know about the root causes um, of health inequities. Right, and I would add to that bottom line, unless you said it, I'm sorry, and also focusing not only at the individual level, even if outside, looking outside of healthcare, we need to look at the various levels of influence on <clears throat> how to address population health. And I apologize for my voice. I had a horrible cold last week. Um, I'm much better now, but my voice is still healing. So apologize for any scratchiness. And, um, sorry, sorry, one last thing. Since I didn't have my updated slide deck, um, the one thing that I had in it that I didn't want to forget to mention is that if you really want to have a, a terrific primer on federal level policy, um, Amy was recently the study director for a new study titled Federal Policy to Advance Racial, Ethnic, and Tribal Health Equity. Um, this is a report that speaks to the federal level of policy across departments and agencies. Um, so it's really worth taking a look at it um, if you want to get a sense of how uh, um, very high level federal government policies can shape uh, people's health outcomes and especially um, inequitable um, um, health health outcomes across populations. Um, the report also talks about the history um, of all of that um, on a number of different factors. So it's it's a really important one to take a look at. Yeah, thanks for bringing that, Belina. It also has a, a action area um, in terms of recommendations, including um, raising community voice and that community voice and expertise is an incredibly important um, evidentiary piece of, you know, piece of evidence that is needed to be included when making policy really at any level, but um, including federal policy and that there are ways to do that. And there's some examples of how um, work by communities has impacted and changed federal policy. So it's not just, Lena's not just mentioning this as a good for you to know, it's to know that there are interventions that can be done at the community level that could, um, it's hard, but could um, impact actual federal policy. Um, and um, the importance of including community voice um, in interventions and uh, as evidence and lived experience as evidence is relevant at every level of intervention. Okay, so I don't see any hands up, but if you have any questions, you know, later on, we're we'll gonna have another Q&A portion. Um, feel free to bring up questions from any part of the presentation today um, during that time. So I get to give you the more boring stuff, the sort of ins and outs of the event and things you should know. Um, we will send notes that have all of this information. So if you don't catch it, but I know hearing it and then also having it can be helpful. And these are important things for you to know. Um, so we will release the case, hopefully right at one o'clock, Maggie might need a minute, you know, after the, the webinar ends, you send that email, but it will have the case that Laura and her team worked on. In that case is um, some important information up front for what to know for the day of, which I will also go over now. Um, the challenge to you, along with background information related to the topic, and then um, there are some appendices, including um, the competitor and advisor guide um, and um, the judging rubric and the agenda for the day. Um, we don't expect the agenda to change. We might need to tweak a few things in the later afternoon, but the morning portion is set. Um, so 
in terms of the judges, um, the judges will be announced about one week before the event. Um, I do encourage you to look at the judges and their um, bios. I would not expect you to change your solution based on who the judges are. However, it might inspire, you know, something that you're already doing, you know, to focus on a little more or to emphasize a little more based on who your audience is. I mean, this is something you need to do in real life if you're presenting a grant to someone or an organization is knowing what's important to them, right? And what it is that they're interested in. So um, while I wouldn't stress over it too much because um, the judges are going to judge you based on what the case writing team asked you to do, um, it is still, it's, it's important to know who you're talking to when you're doing any presentation. Um, the case writing team, so Laura and her team and, and staff will answer questions about the case until 9 a.m. on Thursday, October 5th. Any questions that you ask, we will share with everyone, even logistical things that maybe weren't clear enough or questions about like, would this be okay to include? Is this included in the, um, the charge to us? Things like that. We will um, send those answers to everyone so everyone has all the same information that they're working with. Um, but after 9 a.m. on Thursday, we won't really have, um, there just won't be time um, to do that. So please send any questions by then. And um, that who to send it to, which is Maggie, um, is in the guide that we're sending you. And in, um, yeah, it's in the guide. Um, it is acceptable, but absolutely not mandatory to provide additional material to the judges that expands on your presentation. Um, examples of additional materials might be appendix slides um, that your team doesn't present, but will have on hand um, handy for like during Q&A um, or for the judges to refer to during their deliberations. This might be, for an example, a more detailed budget than what you want to present during the actual presentation, right? But to show that you know how all those funds are going to be spent. Um, or an example mock-up of a brochure or a guide or other materials you might use as part of um, your proposal to give an illustrative example. Um, but Remember, the judges only have about two hours to deliberate, so they can only look at so many materials. So really make sure you focus those on the ones that you really want them, you know, to see um, and consider and leave out anything that's sort of um, peripheral um, because they, they won't have time to review everything anyway if, if you submit too much. Um, so the way the competition will work is we will all go into room 125 um, together, we'll have a kickoff session. Um, Dr. Zhao, who's the president of the National Academy of Medicine, will give some opening remarks, um, and then I'll give some logistical remarks, and then we'll jump right into the competition at 9 a.m. And so a couple important things for you to know. You, you have to hand in your presentation, the PowerPoint, whatever you plan to use, at 8.30 a.m., no later than that. You can email it to Maggie ahead of time, that's fine. Um, you can bring it on a flash drive um, for her to load on the computer. Um, it's a little too tricky for you to use your own computers during the presentation. So we do ask that you get us your slides one way or another. Um, but regardless of if you email the slides or you bring them in, you should go meet with Maggie. Um, she'll be at the computer um, of 125. Um, so you can um, choose your number. So the each team is um, given a number at random. Um, we have seven teams competing this year. And so Maggie will use the random number generator and you'll get your assignment. It could be team one, it could be team seven. Um, and she'll give you a folder that has your team number on it. Hold on to that folder. I'll get to why you need it a little bit later. Um, and so once um, we give those opening remarks, we'll ask all teams to leave except team number one. We cannot have um, teams in the room until after they've presented. That's to keep things fair um, because you you know you can get kind of a leg up by one hearing another team's presentation and two hearing the judges' questions because they will often ask similar questions of many of the teams, um, and that would give you you know undue advance notice. So once you present. You are more than welcome to stay in the room. You're welcome to go outside, catch your breath, and then come back in a little later, um, whatever um, you would like. Um, but um, just know that you can't be in the room till you present. Advisors are welcome to be in the competition room the entire day. We trust that they will not um, give any you know, advice to the teams based on um, the other team's presentations. Um, 
And then after all the teams present, um, we will um, break for lunch. Uh, so we will provide breakfast, lunch, um, and a reception at the end of the day. Um, so you should be well fed. Um, if you have not let us know about allergies yet or any accommodations you need, if that if you didn't put those on the form that the team submitted, let us know right away. Um, during lunch, uh, after lunch, I should say, um, I can't remember the exact order. I think then we're gonna do a group photo with advisors and students. Advisors note that this is a different time than usual. We're doing a little earlier. Um, and then after that, um, in past years, we've heard from teams that it's kind of a bummer, you know, not to hear all the other teams' presentations if they're, especially if they're team like six or seven <laughs> in the order. And so while it isn't possible for us to do that due to the nature of the event, we are going to have ask each team to provide a three to five minute overview of their presentation. You can use slides or not. Um, not using slides is probably easier, but that's up to you. Um, to then um, per give that three to five minute overview to all the other competing teams so everyone can get a good sense of how each team presented um, or um, or attacked the, the, the problem at hand. Um, and it's also really good practice because there are gonna be times, honestly, where you do only have three to five minutes with someone to pitch your idea um, and get that those key ideas across. So it's also really good experience and practice um, for real life. Um, and then after that, um, we have some guest speakers um, that will provide um, a couple of talks um, and we'll provide more information on that the day of the event. Um, and that all during this time, the judges are deliberating. And then we'll all come back together and we will present the awards. And then after the awards um, and everyone takes a sigh of relief, regardless of, you know, just because the day is over, um, we then will have a reception um, with some good food and everyone can chat and network and talk. Um, and then, Sorry, I'm just going through my notes to make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, okay, so then on October 9th, 9th um, it's the National Academy of Medicine annual meeting. The topic this year is from, is women's health from cells to society. So, you know, it's uh, aligns with the topic, um, the general topic of women's health for this year. And um, we ask those of you who plan to attend to note that on your form. Um, and so you will be pre-registered. Please note that pre-registration is required. It's really difficult for us after the fact to get you registered. Um, it costs $150 usually to attend the NAM annual meeting. You're getting, you know, it, that is waived for students, but you have to, well, students in this competition, um, I should say, and advisors, but you have to be registered in advance. Um, and so at the annual meeting, we will have a poster session um, where you will be able to, you know, talk about your solutions um, to NAM members, other attendees, other guests, which so range a huge, huge span of expertise, like everything, of course, healthcare, but behavioral health, um, economics, um, you you name it, you've got it in the in at this meeting. So it's a great opportunity. Um, and we will send you more details early next week about what we need um, for the poster. And um, when we need that by, it'll be about a, a few days before the end of the competition. Um, and we'll give some guidance on that as well. And Laura, actually, you were at the poster session last year, right? So maybe when you give any tips or anything at the end, if you have anything for the poster session to add in from your experience, that would be great. Sure. Um, okay, so I've already talked about most of this actually. Okay, so the judges will have copies of your slides. We will make those copies in the morning when you hand in your presentation. So you do not need to bring copies with you. Um, each team will have 15 minutes to present and 10 minutes for Q&A with the judges. Um, and the judges will then have five minutes to take any notes um, before the next team comes in. So each um, so, so that they, they have time before the next team starts to write down their thoughts, fill out the rubric. Um, 
we're very strict on these times. I will cut you off mid sentence if you're, you know, <laughs> Laura knows, um, if you're in the middle at, at, at that, you know, 15 minute mark um, and with the Q and A. So just, you know, keep that in mind. It's very strict. There's no flexibility. Um, and um, keep that in mind when you answer your questions as well, you wanna answer them thoroughly but you also want to have time for more than one question from the judges, right? Like don't go on and on. Once the point has been made and the question answered, move on. And then if the judges have a follow-up, they can ask that. Um, so information about the competition room. I don't know if we have anyone here who's competing this year, who's competed in the past. This year, we're going to be in room 20, 125. You'll be presenting in the front of the room. There is no stage in the room. This is just a regular meeting room. Um, and in the front, there'll be a podium screen um, and, you know, space in front of the judging table. And so you should think about in advance, you know, how your team is most comfortable standing. It could be all of you in the front of the room. It could be all of you at the podium. Whatever makes you most comfortable. We will have six handheld mics in case you want to um, not use the podium, but you must speak into the mic. It's really, it can be really difficult to hear in the room without using the microphones. Um, We'll also have a clicker with a laser pointer <coughs> for you to use. Um, if you arrive early before the event, you can check out the space. Um, and in addition, in those five minutes between when teams present, um, when the judges are taking their notes, you are more than welcome to come up and, and encouraged to actually get yourself set up and get yourselves ready to go. Um, we're going to have team photos taken by a professional photographer. Um, this will be between about 9 to 1030. The agenda will have assignments by team number so that, you know, you're getting your photo taken, not while you're supposed to be presenting. Um, and so we will provide all of those to you. Um, if your advisor's there, you should definitely get one with your advisor, maybe one without your advisor. And they're really nice. If the weather's nice, we'll take them outside. We have a giant Einstein statue. Um, and, you know, you get to sit on his lap, whatever, take a picture. Um, and it's a nice thing to have. Um, I'm getting close, I promise. Um, while well, waiting for your teams to present, you know, you can wait in room 120, you can, um, which is the holding room, you can wait outside, you can explore the building. Um, and we encourage you, you know, to network, network with each other during downtimes um, with the judges, you know, after the, the um, you know, maybe during the reception or the ward ceremony, the guest speakers, you know, it's a great opportunity to really meet some great people. All right. So I'm going to just, based on years of experience with the case challenge, give you some general guidance um, to help you, you know, do your best. So this is really important. <laughs> Ground your presentation in available evidence, but don't rely on a literature-based rationale alone. So think about the context, the community, um, you know, the purpose of your model. It needs to be evidence-based, but you need to consider other types of evidence and factors as well. Um, think about the assumption, assumptions you're making. What is your logic model, your theory of change? Those are really important things that judges look for. They wanna know, have you thought through how your innovation um, intervention is actually going to make change? Um, you know, when looking at examples that may have been used, um, existing, um, you know, approaches, think about the circumstances that differ from what has been studied or tried to the circumstance that you're trying to present this in, you know, in a DC community, and what are the uncertainties? It's okay for there to be uncertainties, but make sure the judges know you know that and you know what they are and you have a plan to address that or to use your evaluation plan to measure those types of things so that then you could course correct along the way. As Alina was talking about, think through the root or underlying, underlying causes of the problem and be sure that those are considered in your solution. Um, also very important. Um, you could engage the community who will participate in the solution when, um, that you're proposing. You can talk to <clears throat> folks in the community, community centers, whomever, um, that can help you understand um, what the problems are, if your solution would be acceptable, desirable, feasible in the target population. Um, just, you know, 
um, if you do reach out to communities or community members or community groups, um, definitely be thoughtful and careful in how you do that. Make sure you're presenting yourself as students that are doing something um, for a school. You're not researchers. There is no funding associated with this. Um, be thoughtful about how much time and labor you're asking of them when you reach out to them. Um, we will provide a one pager. Maggie will send that today about the case challenge that you can provide to them so that they understand what this is. Um, and make sure to put all your questions together at once so that you don't have to be continually re-reaching out to them. So just be considerate of their time, especially if this is an advocacy organization or community organization that is already stretched thin and already um, underfunded, but at the same time does want the next generation of leaders to learn and excel. So often are happy to help, but again, just being respectful of their time and what you're asking of them. And I have a little bit more guidance in that on that in the notes that we're gonna send out after this call. So I alluded to this earlier, evaluation. Don't forget about your evaluation plan. Think about it carefully. When in the past, when teams haven't given this enough attention, the judges noticed, right? How are you going to know if what you're doing is working? How are you going to know if it's getting to the outcomes that you're proposing? Um, you know, what are your methods for the evaluation process? The winning team last year had a great um, plan for evaluation. Um, I, I think that really impressed the judges, you know, think about pre, mid, post, right? You can't just do post if you don't have a baseline information, right? So these are things you're probably learning about in school and in your classes. So just make sure to apply them. Um, this is a great area to go to your faculty advisor for if you need input, if you don't have a lot of experience with that. And then um, CDC has some best practices um, and we're gonna provide that link um, to um, a workbook that they have in the notes. Um, okay, so don't do too much. I'm almost done, really. Don't do too much. Um, keep in mind that you don't have to solve, solve every problem related to the case challenge in your solution. Identify your goals, your theory of change, and then pick one to three intervention points that your solution can do really well. Um, it's acceptable to refer to other needs, you know, maybe other organizations that are already addressing Y problem. And so you're addressing Z problem, um, or you could work together on that, you know, it, you know, mutually beneficial or something. So just don't overdo it, um, I guess, because then you get way out of the realm of realistic and feasible. Um, during your presentation, early in your presentation, give the audience an elevator pitch, the one or two sentences that provide the essence of your proposal that will be memorable. Remember, they're hearing seven different teams and yes, they'll be taking notes and yes, they're gonna remember many of the particulars of your presentation, but we're all human and can't remember everything, right? And so the, that beginning part, make sure it's clear, understandable and what you know, you're gonna do um, and just really work on that and make sure it's very clear. Um, you know, describe what your um, proposal will look like on the ground, you know, what will actually be done during the intervention, help the judges visualize it in action, um, show that you understand the evidence base, um, you know, talk about that evidence base during the presentation, anticipate potential barriers. This has been a downfall we've seen of teams over the years is not thinking through what some of those barriers might be. And so you can talk about some of them during your presentation, but also the Q&A, having that ready is a great opportunity to talk about what, how you might approach those barriers. <clears throat> um, and I have more information on all of this in the notes. So, um, and then um, just make sure to learn, you know, the terminology and nomenclature of the topic area of the case. Um, there can be differences in sensitivities and how terms are used. Um, and so you'll be, you know, more credible if you're cognizant of these different terms. Um, last thing, so presentation and delivery. I said this before, don't bury the lead, don't rush through your presentation. Um, then key pieces of information can be missed and it'll seem like you, you know, didn't, weren't able to narrow it down to what your key information is, which is really important. Um, 
pause for a moment after key statements, let them sink in, give them a moment to think through that. You know, you might have like two or three really key things. So just take a moment, um, stand behind your proposal and don't lead your responses with apologies. Be confident during Q and A, you worked hard. I'm sure you will have worked hard. You'll have thought through a lot of this, you know, pause and reflect for a moment before answering. You don't have to answer the moment the judge asks you a question. If you need to take a moment to gather, gather your thoughts, that is fine. Um, and don't, don't be overly like be humble as well. Like, of course, the judges might bring up something you didn't consider, but you can then pivot to something you did think through that's related and give them the information on that. OK. Um, and then, of course, practice your transitions both in content slides, um, you know, for, for the verbal presentation, um, you know, a great flow can really make a difference. So I'm gonna stop there. I know that was long. I hope it was helpful. Um, and we will share all that information. And um, I'm gonna let Laura go. Uh, she's gonna provide some best practices based on her experience as a competitor. Um, there might be some repeats and I think that's okay. Redundancy is good. Um, and then she's going to present the case for this year. And then all of us, all four of, us, four of us would be happy to answer any questions you have. So Laura, I hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Amy. So I, I can't stress how important what Amy just shared actually is. And that as you embark on this two week journey, um, you will want to refer back because you're you're going to be consuming a, a ton of information really fast and you're trying to figure out the best ways to to meet the um, criteria that the judges will be using and to really synthesize what you're doing and, and keep it grounded, as she said, in the evidence, but also thinking about, you know, the creative and innovative solutions that can exist within the feasibility and the restrictions related to the funding um, that the that the case is saying that you have to work within. So there are constraints, of course, we don't have unlimited resources, be it money, people, et cetera. Um, I think a couple things that I thought about that I, I'll just share briefly, um, we worked really hard on writing the case, so read it. Read it all the way through. Read it more than once. Um, I remember last year when our team started, we kind of read it so quickly because we were you know really excited and wanted to know what the topic was and wanted to dive through it. And then we started talking and then it was like, oh, wait, we need to read that more carefully and more closely and really think about what it's pointing us to and then make a plan for where um, what additional research we might want to do or what stakeholders or people we might want to reach out to in a respectful and appropriate way, as Amy mentioned, because they're not getting anything out of this. So thinking about what is it that you're offering, we're offering, you know, the chance for them to share about their experiences, but we're not actually offering any tangible solutions directly to those organizations or people. Um, the other thing um, I wanted to share is to really, as a team, think about how you can leverage the strengths of the members on the team, the different backgrounds and the different academic trainings and the programs that you're in, knowing that not everyone is um, in a public health program. So lean on your public health students to think more and help you understand the kind of public health upstream approach. Lean on the other members of the team um, to you know, hear their perspectives and see what they've learned and what they um, think would be really value added to the, um, to the solutions that you're gonna propose. But really remember to keep your eye on the prize and to really focus on a public health strategy, a public health solution. Um, so looking at those upstream strategies um, is really important and thinking about the different levels of intervention that you can um, come up with uh, to address the challenge at hand. One um, other thing is to really be smart and strategic with your time. Two weeks is, is not a lot of time. It's completely doable but it is an intense period of time and you have a lot of other commitments as students and perhaps you're working and other things. And so be really um, over communicate with your team about what you're gonna do, how you can do it, when you can do it, when you, what you can and can't do, um, but really think about how to delegate those tasks. You, you know, Within this two weeks, you're gonna be researching, you're gonna be engaging with stakeholders and getting community insights. You're gonna be um, brainstorming and ideating you know, individually and as a team, you're going to be working on getting feedback from your faculty advisors and incorporating that into your actual final proposal. You're going to be making the slide deck and you're going to be practicing your delivery and thinking about the best way to make this elevator pitch. Um, and you're going to be anticipating questions and that's a whole lot of things. Um, but the beauty of a team is that you can accomplish it if you really think strategically about how best to do that um, and come up with a timeline that will work for everyone and that you're really flexible 
um, as, as you kind of lean into the case and lean into the, the problem solving process. Uh, and then um, I, I will just also echo, um, Amy said something about like be discerning. Like you can't, you can't possibly, you're gonna learn so much and you're gonna have so many amazing ideas. And then you have to make decisions about what you think will be the best um, approach for right now in this community at this time. And so you're gonna make decisions and then you're gonna stand by those decisions. And knowing that there's no one correct or optimal approach, um, that there really are a variety of options that, um, that the evidence points to and that the theory would inform. And so there's no right, there's no one right way um, but that you're going to have to make those decisions and articulate those decisions um, in your pitch so that people can follow along as to why you think these are the right, the best strategies for right now for this population, for this topic at hand. Um, yeah. So I think that's my advice. And without further, further ado, should I announce the topic? Yeah, let's do it. I'm very excited. Okay. So we're really excited. I know that um, everyone knew that women's health was the broad um, uh, kind of general topic. And within that, um, this year's case challenge is a public health approach to addressing the unique health issues impacting women who are currently or at risk of experiencing homelessness in Washington, DC. And do you wanna say a little bit about, um, <clears throat> sorry, the, the challenge to the teens? Like it's- Yes, yep. So, excuse me. So essentially, um, the the challenge is looking at proposals for um, strategies to really improve the health and well being of adult women who are experiencing homelessness in Washington D.C. and those who may be at risk of experiencing homelessness um, in Washington D.C. And so, really looking for these evidence based solutions um, to improve physical health, mental health. Um, the kind of, you know, thinking about the holistic health and the experience of people who may be experiencing homelessness, how can um, the solutions that you will develop really address a sustainable um, um, strategy for helping to improve the health and well-being of women who are experiencing homelessness? Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much for sharing the um, topic. Um, I'm hoping cogs are turning already in everyone's head. Um, and thank you for the best practices you shared. Those were really great points. And we never really know what's going on behind the scenes and what makes that two weeks more now, you know, easy to manage. So that was really great advice. I appreciate that. So any questions on anything, more information on the topic that Laura just presented to you, questions from Laura about you know, about those two weeks and how that goes. Um, questions for us about the population health approach or just the event itself and how it works. I will add, you might notice that this year it's two weeks and one day um, for the challenge. And that's because um, Yom Kippur is this coming Monday. And one of the pieces of feedback, which was really helpful that we got last year was that, you know, one or more of the teams, one or more people missed a day of being able to contribute because of the holiday. And so we took that into account and at least added um, an additional day. So everyone has two weeks where they two two weeks worth of days that they can participate. So um, and, and that brings me to the point, as long as there's no questions yet, um, that we will ask you to fill out a survey at the end of the event um, or you know, midway through. And we really hope you'll fill it out. Your feedback really is helpful. Like that is a specific change we made based on the feedback. We can't make all the changes. Some of it has to run the way it is, um, but also the three to five minute elevator pitch. Um, well, that's more than an elevator pitch, but pitches to each other to share your presentations. That was based on feedback because, you know, teams were really disappointed that they couldn't even get any idea about what the other teams presented. Um, so please do fill out that survey. <laughs> I'll bug you a bunch of times a day in the event too. So, any questions? Like I said, you can drop them in the chat or you can raise your hand or just take yourself off mute. Okay, I'm gonna give another awkward 30 seconds or so just in case anyone's typing something. Um, but oh, not I forgot to mention the about the poster session. Um, yes, oh, yeah, thank I, you. Yeah. Um, I will just say uh, that it was an incredible opportunity to actually be able to attend the, the annual meeting and to be in the audience with these incredible leaders in the field and these amazing experts and to really invigorating and exciting to really get to participate 
um, in, in that space as a current student. But then the poster session was really pretty uh, phenomenal. People were really invested and curious about what we did, what our backgrounds were, how we came up with it. Uh, and you get to meet sometimes, you know, your, your public health, like, uh, models, you know, the role models. I remember we were standing at the poster and everyone wears name tags, thankfully. And um, Karen Glantz, who wrote one of the textbooks that I remember learning my health theory um, in my master's in public health program, walked up and was asking me to talk about what we did and how we did it and why. And I was just amazed that, you know, this is a person that I, I learned these um, seminal things in my classes. And then I get to actually speak with her about how I applied some of that to the, to the case challenge. So really take advantage if you are able to go, even if it's for only a um, part of the day, I would really recommend prioritizing um, the phenomenal opportunity that this provides to be able to attend um, what is typically a closed meeting. Thank you, Laura. Okay, well, I'm gonna assume that Maggie, Alina, Laura, and I did such a great job sharing the information that you have no questions versus it being that you're so overwhelmed by all this information. I'm gonna go with the former. <laughs> um, and um, I see Alina just dropped um, something in the chat. Do you wanna just say it um, since we have a, a, another minute? Um, Cause if we sign sure. off and the chat gets lost, so. Yeah, I just, I didn't wanna take any time if people had questions, but I had two more thoughts that I wasn't sure were, were touched on or I missed them. One was that um, sometimes it's helpful to look at, the, it's always helpful to look at the list of judges that we're going to release about a week before the competition, because it gives you a sense of the sorts of things they might ask. So I provided as an example, a judge who was coming from a foundation asked a lot about sustainability. What's your sustainability plan? So be prepared for like, if somebody's an attorney, like what are the sorts of things they might ask? Um, and then when we prepare a National Academy's consensus committees, committee to talk to the media or to answer audience questions, we do a lot of thinking about what are the hard questions that they're likely to ask? What if they ask us this? What if they ask you that? Um, and so teams can really work, can sort of, uh, you know, pretend that they're just listening to this de novo and just, uh, you know, coming up with, with a plan for how you might answer some, some thorny questions that might arise. Thank you, Alina. And one more note about the judges, we do try to get a multidisciplinary group together. Um, for some of you, it may not immediately be obvious why we have so and so with X experience, but then, you know, as you hear their questions, it might become more clear. Um, or, um, you know, this is a multidisciplinary event. And so we try to have a multidisciplinary panel of judges as well. And yes, Laura, please do have fun. Like hopefully this getting to collaborate with new people, new competitors and, you know, getting to be creative. And I don't want, you know, when I was talking about evidence earlier, it is a fine balance between being creative and something new and evidence. So do be creative, do try to think of a new approach to something or a new way to do something or a new twist on something. Just also think about why it's going to work. What is that theory of change? What is what is some evidence out there that you can base it on as to why it might work, right? We're not asking you to come up with something. It would definitely work. We never know, right? Um, even, you know, when people are out there applying for grants and stuff, it's it's the idea of it. And, you know, so it needs to be something inspiring enough that it's different, um, but also just grounded in reality. So do have fun with it. Okay. All right. Well, like I said, it's not your last opportunity to ask questions. You can send questions to Maggie, um, whoever is the appropriate one, the case writing team, us, whomever will write out the answer. We'll send it out to everyone. So you certainly still have opportunities to ask questions, um, ask questions of your advisors. They're there for you um, and um, have fun. And we can't wait to see you on the six and hear what it is you've come up with. We're, we're so excited. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Oh, and for sorry, for any teammates who maybe wanted to see this but couldn't be on, we will send out a recording. Um, it takes a couple of hours to get it from Zoom. So Maggie is going to send out the email in a minute or two with the case and some other materials, and then another email in a few hours with the PowerPoint and um, the recording. And thank you for all the thank yous. It was nice to see you all, and we look forward to meeting you. Bye.